Yes, we can. Can yes. you see my first? Yes, we can. All see. right, then let's then let's begin. Well, um, good afternoon to you and early morning to me. Um, I couldn't sleep well, so I changed this talk a little, starting at about 4 a.m. my time. <laughs> so we'll see how the new version does. Um, my name is Glenn Pfeffer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Los Angeles at Cedars Sinai Hospital, and all I do is foot and ankle work. Um, when I first went into practice, I did hand surgery and foot surgery, um, but the demand was so much higher for foot and ankle that slowly I gave up the hand when I was in San Francisco for 18 years. And then when I left, I came to Cedars Sinai in Los Angeles, and I've just been doing foot. For those of you who don't know Cedars, um, it was just rated the number two hospital in the United States and the number three orthopedic department in the United States. Um, I'm not sure how all those ratings are done, actually, but it is the most prestigious rating, so we're all very uh, proud of that here. Um, I'm a, an academic employee. I, I don't, um, I don't, um, I'm not in private practice. I, I simply get my paycheck um, uh, every about five years, so um, the things I do are, are not directly related to money, which uh, is very good for me. I didn't like to be a businessman when I was in private practice. So today we're gonna to talk about um, CMT and uh, the, the surgical construction, reconstruction of, of what, what the predominant problem is, which is cable varus feet. Let's see if we get this all to work. Now, for those of you who'd like, um, you can look at all the work I do on Instagram. I'm a little embarrassed about this always. When I went into practice, if if somebody did any kind of publicity, they'd be thrown out of the medical societies. But a 16-year-old patient once said to me, why don't you set up Instagram? And I did, and I think it's been very successful. And every Sunday, I talk to three or four people around the world by video chat for free about their CMT. But that, that's where you can find us at Shark and Retooth Surgery on Instagram. So I... I wanted to do this talk because I really enjoy doing lectures or talks or talking to people across different specialties because there's so much miscommunication, isn't there? It's hard enough for me to talk to another doctor, let alone a patient, about CMT, or at least it's easier for me now, but so many of you have problems with that. This video just sort of typified to me the importance of communication. So I wanted to share it with you. All right. How many of you feel that way sometimes when you're going to your doctor, right? So, as I said, I have nothing to disclose. I, I'm on the medical advisory board of the Shark and Tooth Association, the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation, but nothing other than that. And there's, I get no money for that. So, as you all know, um, in 1886, these fellows, Shark and Marie, um, uh, um, discussed uh, or proposed shark and reed tooth as a, as a neurologic condition. They thought it was spinal related, centrally related. It was really tooth in England who proposed that it was peripheral uh, nerve related. Uh, my wife's British and she always wants me to mention that. A um, hundred years later, I just went into practice in San Francisco and I saw my first CMT patient. I came into the room, there was a young woman there um, I thought, what is this, uh, an ankle sprain, um, you know, uh, some type of sports injury. She was very fit um, and live. And uh, then she said to me, do you know what CMT is? And I had heard of it maybe in medical school. I think it was probably discussed in less than one second in the neurology class. 
But I looked at her and I said, oh, yes, I know what CMT is. It's what we'd call a white lie, for those of you who know that in, in English. And then I saw crutches in the corner of the room. And she said, she was probably 26. She said, well, that's good. I, I'm glad you know, because I don't meet doctors who know what it is. And she said, I'm going to show you something I've never shown anyone, um, my feet. And she showed me these gnarled feet. They looked like oak trees, twisted. And she said, I can barely walk. I've never been on a date, um, although she was a very attractive, very bright person. And she said, is there anything you can do for me? Well, that began my career with CMT because I researched this extensively. I spoke to a lot of people in the world and it was obvious there was no clear consensus on what to do, but we did one surgery and then we did the other. And then she started to date and she thanked me and then she got married and then she had a child. And I think that was really the beginning for me. And it was hard to let go of that. Um, now I've done more than 700 CMT surgeries which I think assuredly has to be one of the largest um, experiences in the world for this problem, um, uh, certainly in the United States. Uh, so when I first got to Cedars, um, this woman came in, 17 years old. Um, her parents had looked all over the United States for someone who they felt confident could help her. Her name was Sarah, and she only wanted one thing, she wanted to walk down the high school aisle without holding on to her father when she graduated. Um, I knew a lot more about CMT by then. Uh, I operated on her, both feet, um, and here she was. Um, she walked down the high school aisle. Years later, a few years ago, I called her up and I was worried. I said, Sarah, how are you doing? And she said, Dr. Pfeffer, you don't understand. I just walked around London for three or four miles in cute shoes with my family. I work in a pizzeria now as a waitress. I'm going to law school. So that really cemented my interest in this. I went to Cedars and I said, we need to set up a CMT center here. And then one thing followed the other. Um, there she was, oh, probably a year after her surgery. Um, so people say to me, when will I retire? And when I look at a case like that, and I remember back to her coming in, I would simply say, why would I ever retire? Okay, you know about this, you've been talking about it all day, very heterogeneous bunch of neurologic conditions with more than 150 gen genotypic variations. The, the phenotype, however, is, is fairly consistent. Um, if we had a just, um, Let's see, why is my computer? If you had to just lump this, there are basically two types of feet for me. There's the cavo varus high arched foot, not necessarily this bad. Uh, and then there's the flail foot or the more paralyzed foot, which is about 20% of patients. But this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about the cavo varus foot, which is so disabling to patients. Now, why does it happen? Well, I, I think, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my watch timer here. Um, I think I think we um, most of us know why this happens, but it's a muscle imbalance. Something very unusual happens in the lower extremity. Some muscles get strong, stay strong, and others weaken. And there gets to be a tremendous twisting unbalance that occurs. Now, there's a classic thought that well, the posterior tibial tendon stays strong on the inside of the ankle. The ankle, muscles on the outside get weak, but there can be tremendous variation in this. And what happens? The muscles in the toes unbalanced, and the toes deform. The muscles in the foot become unbalanced. Without this unbalancing, with some staying strong, the foot would be flat. It might not move, but it would be a better foot than this, as it would be flat on the ground. When they're not flat on the ground, when they're crooked, as I call them, there's unloading, pain, um, the unbalance. Of course, there's neuropathic pain. People with CMT have neuropathic pain often. But I would just ask you to talk to your friends. If you have CMT, speak to your friends tonight 
and have them twist their foot inward, take their shoe off, and just walk around for a while like that. It's going to hurt. So you can see by correcting this problem, the pain will be diminished. Not completely gone, but diminished. They're high stress areas, and right below this, often people get a fracture. The bone just can't tolerate that stress of walking on the side of the foot with hundreds of thousands of pounds of stress. Now, this is the typical type of foot we get in advanced cases. The tibialis anterior, the ankle extensor becomes weak, the perineal muscles weaken, the foot becomes unstable. And I see someone like this so at least twice a week, and she said, is there anything you can do for me? I'm told there's nothing that can be done. And often they've traveled thousands of miles for an opinion because they've never had any help offered to them by the medical field in the United States. And what you have is a very stiff, rigid foot. And it'll be driving like in a car with no shock absorptions, just like this. And that causes pain and uh, suffering in patients. It's, it's, it's a tough disease, especially in this country where you tell patients, when a patient tells somebody, I have CMT, and the answer usually is, oh, is that the country music channel? <laughs> All right. Over time, the ankle become loose. And over further time, the ankle could become arthritic. Now, braces are wonderful. Look at this woman. She can barely walk without holding on to the door. Here she is in braces. It's life changing. But she has a foot that's flat on the ground. She has a flail lower extremity. She's paralyzed below the knee. Nobody wants that, but much better to have that than to have the crooked foot. Now, there are many braces available um, in the United States. They're all of these different names. Some of them are over the counter. I'm sure they could be purchased in Hungary. Um, I'm not sure they'll be covered by your national health insurance. But these are the types of braces if you're paralyzed below the knee and your foot's flat on the ground that you want to wear. These are called ground reaction braces, grapho braces. Um, they are wonderful for the flat split foot. Um, the problem is they're expensive, a um, thousand, two thousand US dollars. They're made of carbon fiber, which allows them to have that flex, and they're very light, but it's 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 brittle. It's brittle. We just saw a patient from Greece who lives in a town on, of cobblestones, and they said, you know, every six months they break the brace apart. So in those cases, a regular plastic AFO may be preferable. But for me, I haven't prescribed a regular AFO plastic type, oh, probably for 20 years. Um, so the question is, is, who do we brace and who do we operate on? Um, and that's the really um, key issue, isn't it? If you're a patient, if you're a doctor, uh, who, who gets surgery? Who's going to benefit from surgery? Well, for me, it's very simple. Um, you don't brace a crooked foot unless there's no option. Um, half of the calls that I do on these video chats on Sunday are from out of the country. Um, they can be from countries where patients have very, very few funds. Um, and maybe their only option is to brace their foot. I was just talking to someone or video chatting from India with a horrible deformity, but they have no option. So they'll put a brace on their foot. I understand that. But we're talking about the ideal situation. Don't brace a crooked foot. Please don't brace a crooked foot if you can all help it. Take this young boy. There's nothing we can do for you, as doctors said. Live with this the rest of your life. Um, look at the calluses that he has. And he's in a brace. And he lives in the Midwest. He's a hardy young fellow. And he does okay with his brace. There's nothing so, um, excuse me for a second, there's nothing so miserable about that, um, except for the fact that he's miserable. Um, and in, in, in Los Angeles and in the United States, the shame for me is no one's given him an option. 
The brace people keep making braces. Many of the neurologists here just look at CMT as a, a, a neurologic problem that can't be helped with surgery. Um, and no one's given him the option. Uh, I have never had a patient who I've seen like this that turned down an operation because he needs a foot that's flat. Even if he needs to be braced the rest of his life, even if he does, he'll do so much better with a foot that's flat in the brace. Otherwise, it's like this, right? Sticking a triangular shaped foot into a hole that doesn't match it. All right. This is a gal from Australia. She, we, I never saw her as a patient. She said, I'm told there's nothing to do for me, doctor. Um, you know, I, I live in a brace. And I tried to give her the name of a surgeon in Australia who might help her, but she was told there was nothing to do. Um, yeah. I mean, in all honesty, in certain patients, they would be better off with an amputation of their left leg. I mean, you all see with a good below the knee prosthesis, what people do, they go back to the army, they hike mountains. Um, I would never suggest that because her foot can be brought flat with surgery. But um, I, I tried to get her here to this country, but it wasn't possible. Right, let's just see what it is. So this yellow fellow was from Israel. Both feet were like the left foot. He was in a wheelchair. Um, you understand the story now. I'm sorry, there's no way we could help you. He hadn't walked. He hadn't walked since probably the age of oh, 10 years old. He left the office with a walker. It was very gratifying. So if we're doing surgery for patients who want surgery or need surgery and for doctors who are going to do it, there are three main goals. It's really very simple, actually. What do we need? What do you want? You want a foot that's flat on the ground. Even if you have to be braced, it's flat in the brace with those without high stress areas. You want an ankle that's stable. How many people in the audience have CMT that if they don't wear a brace, keep tripping? Of course, because the muscles are weak on the outside of the ankle. And you need to like to have no braces. Nobody wants to wear a brace if you don't have to. So with the right tendon transfers in many patients, we can eliminate the foot drop and eliminate the braces, or at least minimize the braces, go from a bulky brace to a much smaller one. Now, this is a joke, this slide, but the controversies in surgery are extensive. You know, one person thinks green, one person thinks white. I mean, the surgery controversy in the world and about CMT is probably as different as Donald Trump and President Biden, you know, and you know their differences. So what I did several years ago with the help of the Shark and Marie Tooth Association is I got together 14 or 15 of the smartest people I knew about CMT in the United States. We met in Chicago. The CMTA, the Shark and Marie Tooth Association, locked us in a room and said, you're not getting out until you come up with a consensus statement. This is available online to see for surgeons that are interested or patients that want to be smart about what surgery they might need. And it's, a, I think, excellent document. Uh, it took several years to produce. The key issues here, I think, from this document are two. One is there's a specific sequence of the surgical procedure. And I, I learned something myself from this group in reading the document over. You have to do things in a certain way to get the best results and also do surgery as soon as possible. People say, when should I do it? The day that you wake up or the day that your child wakes up, and you know you can't live with that foot the rest of your life because of its crooked posture, that's the day you should see a surgeon. And if you see one surgeon and they say there's nothing to do, then see the next and the next and the next until you find someone who will help you. Ideally, somebody who knows CMT surgery. I used to say it would be nice if you met a surgeon who does at least one CMT surgery a month. That could be very difficult. Last year, we did 70 CMT surgeries that's a really huge number, um, and it's taken, uh, you, you won't find that probably in most places, but try to find someone who has experience with this. Now, since that consensus statement paper, we've done several studies here at Cedars that have proven out what all of us knew clinically. This paper that just came out last year shows that the longer there's abnormal pull on a bone during development, during adolescence, 
the more the bone becomes deformed. Well, that's not surprising. Um, so the earlier you do it, the less deformity. This paper showed the extreme contractures and where they occur by delaying the surgery longer in life. So how do we do an operation? Everyone goes to sleep. They get a regional popliteal block, a shot around the knee when they're asleep. That gives short relief of pain. And then we put indwelling nerve catheters. They're not available every, anywhere, everywhere. They're not critical. But if you're doing the surgery as an outpatient, it's very helpful. It's a little pain pump. It's a little pump full of pain fluid. You push the button and it's infused around the nerve. That lasts three or four days. We have a big team of people who do this. The, I use loop magnification. As I said, I used to be a hand surgeon. Um, the surgery is, is vast. Uh, on Wednesday, I revised a 10-year-old surgery. She'd been operated on Florida. It took six hours with uh, probably over 14 different procedures that we did. Um, so the sequence here of the surgery for me is very important. Um, the first thing that has to be done is to release all of the contracted tissues. You really don't know, or I don't know, what to do with the bone until all of the soft tissues are released. That includes Achilles tendon, plantar fascia, midfoot structures, contracted tendons. After that, we cut the bones and we shift them. Fixing the heel bone and getting the heel from an interned varus position to a valgus position is very difficult often. And there's some nice papers we published on how to do those bone cuts. Um, um, I, I'd advise someone looking those up if they're interested in this type of surgery. And then you have to balance the muscles. Um, the most common problem that I see is the muscles have not been balanced adequately after the surgery. And you see these, um, oh, so sad, the, the patients, they've gone through a big surgery, they've rehabilitated for six, eight months, only to have the problem come back again. Many surgeons think there's one way to do this surgery. I would just suggest that with 13 or 14 different procedures and variables, each case is very unique. How much bone to remove, how tight to make the tendon transfer, what soft tissue to release. Um, close your eyes. I'm going to show surgical pictures. If you don't want to see blood and guts and bones moving around, close your eyes for a little while. Um, we don't need somebody fainting in the audience. So soft tissue releases. Um, the plantar fascia will get cut. The Achilles will be lengthened in almost all cases. The toe tendons get contracted and we release those percutaneously. Here, the posterior tibial tendon has been elevated on the medial side of the foot. And we're releasing all of the contractures in the midfoot. You know how these feet are adducted or twisted around? We have to release that. This for the surgeons in the room is very similar to approach of a club foot. I, the spring ligament is taken down, the talonavicular capsule, but leave the subtalar joint. I've had overcorrections when I've released the subtalar joint. And here you can see a bone wedge taken out of the heel. And we can shift this bone. Uh, we can rotate the tuberosity of the calcaneus. The soft tissue has been released above and below. Often these patients will have an additional plantar fascia release here to get this corrected. All right. And here, the final one is the type of tendon transfers that can be done. This person has a drop foot. Their posterior tibial tendon was not working for uh, the transfer. So we've transferred the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus through the interosseous membrane, and she did quite well. So you use what you can to get these transfers to work. You can open your eyes now if they've been closed, promise. Okay. So is the surgery worth it? There's risk. Absolutely. It's 100% worth it. I can look any patient who's got a crooked foot in the eye in your audience and tell you, I guarantee you that you'll be better. I don't know how much will be better. I don't know if it'll be better for 20 years because CMT is considered a progressive disease. But in my lifetime, my career time so far, being very active with hundreds of cases, especially over the past 20 years, I've been in California the whole time, and I don't really hear from patients that say, oh, my significant deformity has come back. Some patients need a fusion, a limited fusion. 
Never fuse the ankle in a CMT patient. It's the ankle that goes up and down. Much better if you can to have a ground reaction brace because it gives you fluidity of gait. But the bones in the bottom of the foot, the subtalar joint, it's fine to fuse these if you need to. But I can promise everyone they'll be better. It's just a question of how much better. Now let's just take a look and we'll finish up. And what I've done here is I, I have no desire to give you false hope. I have absolutely no desire to do an operation on somebody I won't help. What's the point? I'll probably get my last contract for five years uh, in a year, uh, maybe my last one, and I get a paycheck every two weeks. Why, why do I need to operate on somebody who I'm going to make worse? That's the worst thing that can happen to me at Cedars. But take a look. Both of these feet were the same before surgery, 17 years old. Hi, my name is Alma, and I'm going to have surgery with Dr. Pepper. This is a different like patient. He always says you can't put a crooked foot into an AFO or a brace. Um, when I first got it, I was very excited because I thought, okay, this is going to work out perfectly. But it actually just causes more pain because my foot is crooked in it. Um, you would think that it would be helpful, but it's not. So that was a different patient, another one. This gal's from Boston. She's a nurse at Boston Children's Hospital. She looked at all the major hospitals in Boston, including Mass General, and I must say I was very honored that she came out here for surgery. Oh, Hi. I'm sorry about that. Different patient. This is a man. You'll see her in a minute. This is a, this is a man I just saw in the office yesterday. Hi. My name is Alex. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I've had CMT since uh, adolescence. I'm 40 years old now. And biggest thing for me with this disorder and even the surgery was the leap of faith that it takes to get done. Um, and uh, sorry, man, it's like making me. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal. And if I was going to have even a sliver of, of normalcy, I had, and I knew I had to get the surgery done. Um, I want to be able to spend time with my kids, do these basic things with my kids, and the way things are going, that was not going to be the case after a couple of years. So it makes it all worth it to me. So I showed this video to my wife last night. I said, should I keep this into my, put this in my talk? She says, well, it doesn't look that different, the two sides, but for anyone who has CMT in the audience, you know how different the, these are. Every time he steps up, he rolls his ankle like that very first video I showed. Now he's stable. He's had no fusions. He's had Achilles lengthening, plantar fascia release, percutaneous flexor tenotomies of the toes, calcaneal osteotomy, midfoot release, posterior tibial tendon, flexor hallucis longus to the perineus brevis behind the leg because he had no perineal function at all. First, I'll transfer the longest to the brevis. If that's not available, I'll use the flexor hallucis longus to the perineus brevis. If that's not available, I'll use the flexor digitorum longus to the brevis. And if that's not available, I'll fuse the subtalar joint or the transverse tarsal joint. This is the nurse I was talking about. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm from Boston. I'm a nurse and I'm a person with CMT. I'm also a parent of a child with CMT. I was diagnosed four years ago at my first appointment with my doctor for CMT um, for my foot deformities. The very first time I met them, they said, great, we're going to get you fitted for your AFO braces that you'll have to wear basically forever. And that was extremely overwhelming to me. And I began pursuing other options. So I came out here to Cedar sinai in November. I had my first foot operated on and it was truly a miracle. I think when you see the difference between my but without the surgery and my foot with the surgery, you'll notice right away um, how good, how straight, how much better my foot looks thanks to Dr. Pfeffer and the amazing team here at Cedar sinai So I just really encourage anyone, a patient, a parent of somebody with CMT to really look into other options, especially surgery here. Now she had no fusions and I wanna make two things clear in my last minute or two. I'm not against doing fusions, triple arthrodesis, subtalar fusion, and the surgeons in the room understand what I'm saying. And there's nothing wrong with a well-done fusion, but it's better not to have it. I'll just say parenthetically, I was born with a subtalar fusion. 
I have a coalition. I have no side to side motion in my heel. Um, I think part of the reason that I so understand CMT patients is because I never knew what was wrong with me. I was screamed at in soccer. I was an incredible athlete going to my right, but not, but sorry, but not to my left because I had this coalition. But there's nothing wrong with having a, a isolated fusion. And the other thing is, I'm, this is not a talk about anti-braces. I send people for CMT braces probably three times a week. But this is, is a talk about pro-surgery for the right person and giving a patient a choice, if possible. These people came from long distances, and they had not been given a choice. And I think anyone looking at this would say that this, the choice they made was a good one. And these are not just isolated cases. These are, these are good results. But as I said, most patients can expect to have some great benefit from having a foot that's flat on the ground. This 38-year-old woman has CMT. She's been operated on three times on the left side. And for the surgeons in the room, what you see there is an inguinal, uh, a, an inguinal skin graft because people thought that, well, they would transfer lymph nodes to her lateral foot from the inguinal area to decrease the swelling, when, of course, the problem was from the CMT. Um, here she is postoperatively. She came into my office and she said, Dr. Pfeffer, I have body hair growing on my ankle because I've had a skin graft taken from, you know, up by my abdomen. And that was actually done right here at Cedar sinai by someone. So it shows you, it just shows you the, the variability and understanding of disease. This is little Emma from Boston. Look at her left foot. She was told at Boston Children's Hospital that she had to be in braces the rest of her life. Here she is four months, only four months after her surgery. Another patient. And I'll be done here just in about a minute for those who are timing me. This young man from Kentucky on our East Coast, I saw him, he'd had failed surgery on the right. The night before surgery, about 10 o'clock, I got paged from the hospital, he wanted to talk to me. He said, Dr. Pfeffer, I've thought about it. If you wanna amputate my leg tomorrow, you can. I've just really had enough of this. I can't go through another failure. Well, we didn't do that. And about nine months later, I got this video from him with a little note that said, Thank you so much. I just walked through the snow for the first time in my life with my children. Why would I retire? Hi, my name is Jillian and I'm 12 years old. And I came here in Cedar Sinai to get my surgery done. And my feet, it looks wonderful. And now it's flat on the ground, not like the other feet. And the other feet is like, Dad, this side is now amazing. How was the surgery? It was great. Did you have a lot of pain? No, no, it wasn't that much pain. The pain pump helped? Yes. That was two weeks after surgery. Here she is out of her cast four months after surgery. Clearly, the left has been operated on. The right's about to be operated on the next day. So my point here is she won't need a brace, I don't think, unless her CMT disease progresses. But even if she does, it's clear the benefits from surgery. And then finally, the surgery work. Does it last? It's a progressive disease, people say. But you know, if you start at C plus and you get worse, you end up at an F. If I can get someone to be up at a B plus or an A minus, the worst that might happen is they'll end up down at a C plus. But I think the surgery does persevere. We're doing a lot of studies on this. And I would just finally say that, actually, you're the first people to know about this. We're going to submit it next month. We just finished the study. It's the largest follow-up of CMT surgery using patient-reported outcome measure information system, which is the NIH-sponsored PROMISE scores that many of you know. 
We looked at CMT patients one year after their surgery with physical function, pain, and mood depression, mood and depression. And every single one of these 72 patients um, were statistically improved. And that's for one year. We'll see what happens at five and 10, but certainly it's very, very promising results. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, would you have a couple of uh, minutes for some questions? Maybe we have some questions from the audience. I'm wide awake now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience to the speaker? I think I will start while the others are thinking. Is it true that you've been a magician when you were much younger? <laughs> well, if much... <laughs> I still am a magician. Yes, um, I, I don't mean about surgery. Yes, I, I, um, I used to perform at nightclubs um, and um, I still do magic. I have a half a room filled with magic tricks. And um, during COVID, um, I, I used to put on virtual magic shows for people. Uh, I, I, I love magic. I used to own doves and, and rabbits and I would levitate and chop people in half. This is, in a way, magic as well, what you do. We have a question. Uh, hey, Mr. Pfeffer, I'm, I'm Tomasz Terebeshi from the Samaritan University Department of Orthopedics. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And I have a special question to you. Maybe it's a bit too orthopedic, but uh, uh, the audience is not only specialists, so sorry about this question. But you mentioned that every case is unique and every surgery is unique that how would you decide which soft tissue should be released or every time you have to release all that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. No, it, it's a superb question and, and it's an, an honor to meet you and to be part of this program. I, I'm really excited by it. Um, you'll, you'll, you, you'll understand exactly what I mean. I'm talking to a friend of mine who's a trauma surgeon here, right? And he goes, I know what to do with CMT. He said, you transfer the posterior tibial tendon to the top of the foot, you transfer the longus to the brevis, and uh, you cut the plantar fascia. And you lift up the first ray, right, with an osteotomy. I said, yeah, that's certainly what you do. He said, what's the big deal? So as you know, each of these cases present very differently. Um, and, and the demyelinating ones, the CMT1As, I think, are a little more consistent but the twos and these, the, 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 the ax, I'm sorry, forgive me, the axonal CMT types present in a very unusual fashion. So what I'll do is, I'll, for me, for the sake of time, the Achilles almost always has to be lengthened, not because it's causing an equinus, but because the Achilles inserts medially and it's causing a varus deformity. Very controversial in this country, but I would say 95% of my cases I do a hook lengthening and I leave the lateral most portion of the Achilles intact. Then I'll make an incision along the medial foot, right? And I'll look at the posterior tibial tendon. The key there is to get enough length. Most people here don't. John Sue, one of the great pediatric orthopedic people, you know, the decade, the generation before me taught me this. And that's dissect the posterior tibial tendon all the way out to the cuneiform. Maybe you do this, but we'll actually lift a little bit of the navicular because, to, and then we tubularize the tendon and put a, a suture on it. But if I don't get that extra inch, which I will do by dissecting the tendon all the way out to the cuneiform, I don't have enough length to, to put the, the right tension on it. Next, I'll, so that, that helps, right? That's help, we're, help, we're desupinating the foot. Then I'll put a, uh, always almost, you have the adduction, uh, like a club foot, you know better than I do. I'll go into the talonavicular joint and release it. Never, I, I released the subtalar joint in a few patients and I got overcorrections, particularly in these hyper lax, you know, young children. Um, I'll divide the spring ligament and I'll make sure all of the expansion of the posterior tibial tendon is released. I'll release some of the, whatever plantar structures there are that need to be released. So let's see, then we'll bring up the tendon and bring it to the side of the foot. The plantar fascia, it's interesting. 
um, especially if there's significant depression of the first ray you know, or, or, or varus of the forefoot, valgus of the forefoot, um, uh, I'll release the plantar fascia in the midfoot. You could do it, uh, you, you may, a lot of the pediatric people do through the medial side, but I'll make a separate incision here. Um, I'll often release the plantar fascia also underneath the calcaneus, which I'll get to in a minute, but we'll release the plantar fascia. So let's see, that really is the soft tissue releases I do. And then when we cut the calcaneus, which doesn't always have to be done, but when it does, I'll release all the soft tissue around the tuberosity because some of these are very difficult. So I'll do a, a Dwyer, <clears throat> release all the soft tissue, if in the worst cases, translate it laterally and also rotate the heel because it's completely free the tuberosity then. You just have to watch out for overcorrection. And then of course the first ray with a cuneiform opening wedge osteotomy or a closing wedge osteotomy to the metatarsal. I don't, oh, and then often we'll do percutaneous flexor tenotomies. I don't like weakening the foot, but I think if you divide the flexors and the toes, you know, they still keep flexion power, right? Because they don't contract that much, the, the tendons. Does that help? Or does that give you my thought process? It is. Thank you very much for the detailed answer. Hi, this is uh, Jula Chadi. I'm a pediatric neurologist at Connecticut Children's, and I'm oh, just please. here. And so I have a non-surgical question. What, uh, do you use any long-term or immediate outcome measures that so you can then systemically report and uh, compare if, um, your cases and the success of the treatment? And like my colleague, Kristen Pierce, uses gait, uh, you know, gait analysis uh, to, to monitor uh, pre-surgically, post-surgically, more um, quantitatively the outcome of surgeries? Well, that's a great question. First of all, I just emailed, you probably know Bob Kay, right, who's now head of orthopedics here at Children's Hospital. I just spoke to Bob last week, and I said, Bob, do you think the pediatric orthopedists, like, you know, and, and pediatric neurologists, would be interested in doing like a consensus type meeting the way that uh, that we did for adults. And he just emailed, I just saw an email to, to Kristen there where you are. And if you guys are interested, I'd love to help with that. You know, we'll get you and Kristen and maybe 10 other people in the country or world together and work on a consensus statement for pediatrics. Um, the, for us, um, um, most of my patients are from out of state, right? Um, Many of them are from, well, some of them are from out of the country. Um, uh, you know, each year there are probably five or six people from out of the country. So it's impossible for me to get x-rays and, and follow them up. But what we do is we get weight-bearing CAT scans on all patients preoperatively. And when patients come back to have the other foot, we get another weight-bearing CAT scan of the same foot to sort of see how I did. And we're just gonna publish that data to see how good the correction is. But the promise scores, which, which you know about, I, I think are really the best um, for this particular disease. You know, Dr. Shai has, um, uh, what's it called, the, the CMT evaluation. Um, but I can't do that because we can't do any type of, of gait analysis because the patients aren't here. Um, but I think the promise is, is good because for people in the audience, what the promise does, and it's, it's as good as we get in terms of patient reported outcomes, it's, you know, it's sponsored by the National Institute of Health, is, is it lets us know what the function is. So whether or not the person's a little weak, if their function is better, then that's a great outcome from surgery. You know, whether the talonavicular joint is reduced or whether their gait, a gait lab would be wonderful, but, but, but I'm very pleased with the promise. So we get that at every visit. And on the study we're going to publish, um, you know the expression, it was like pulling teeth, but we got in touch with all these patients around the world to see how they were doing with their promise scores. So that's a long answer, but what we use is promise and we use x-rays where possible. I tried to do a gait study, but it was impossible because a pre and post-op. You, you guys should do that, pre and post-op gait study if you haven't already. Thank you. And uh, as part of the, inter you know, the Neuropathic Consortium, we are happy to do participate in that, um, that consensus studies. 
Well, you might, you might, yes, you really, if you, this is wonderful actually, because Rich Davidson, who's an orthopedic surgeon at CHOP, who helped train me, said, oh, you should get in touch with the people at UConn because they, 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 they're interested in this. And so if, if, you, if you happen to mention to her that we met and uh, she got this email out of the blue and you know, you would come, maybe another pediatric neurologist, I hope, and then you get 10 orthopedic, pediatric orthopedic surgeons in the room. Because what the PD, the PD pods, you know, the pediatric orthopedic surgeons do is actually quite different than what the adults do. And I, I think we can both learn from each other. Thank you Thank very you. much, Glenn. Thank you. We had a question that we received during the registration, and it's about the age of your patients. Um, you mentioned also during your uh, presentation that it's better to have surgery done at a younger age. Is there a specific age, or is there a reason within aging why you say that? I mean, is puberty influencing this? or? Uh, yeah, another brilliant question, and there's absolutely no answer to it. You know, we... We're just publishing a big paper in the major orthopedic literature. I was very proud. It was accepted in our JOS, the Yellow Journal. And basically, it's, 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 it's based on the literature, but also on, on the experience that, that we have you know, with hundreds of patients. So what I found with that is, A, things get worse during puberty. They really can accelerate. The neurologist could maybe explain to us why in many patients. So if I see someone just at the beginning of puberty and they're not that bad yet. They're, they're not that crooked. We'll wait because you really want to see what you're going to get in a couple of years. Um, I operated on an 11-year-old woman, girl this week, but she's really a young woman already. You know, she's not, her physes are closing. And so the, the key, though, is to operate, I think, as soon as the deformity starts to present itself and prevents racing in a comfortable way. Because if you have a foot like this and you can brace it comfortably like this, well, that's fine. Brace the foot until the person goes through adolescence. But so many people can't have their foot braced without pain. Um, they also become self-conscious as they get older, you know, through adolescence. And we'll do surgery as, as soon as it, it starts to become impossible for bracing. I won't, I know some people have operated on four-year-olds, five-year-olds. I've never operated myself on anyone younger than seven. Um, remember that girl on the beach I showed the picture there? She really couldn't be braced. And um, the surgery was life-changing for her. If nothing else, she'll probably forget about it with the foot she had by the time she's reaching puberty and worried about whether or not the guy she likes likes her. Thank you very much, Glenn. Van még bárkinek kérdése? Thank you, Glenn. I think this was it all. Thank you very much again for starting your weekend with us and being here. We uh -huh. really appreciate it. Well, it's a great honor. I wish I understood the last talk, but I <laughs> it looked like an excellent talk that you had on the spine from the pediatric person. I, but uh, hopefully I'm next time we this. can have you here by person and then you can enjoy everything from beginning to the end. Thank you for inviting me. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye.